with all of you, but <clears throat> I hope that you are already not exhausted. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> this is not a well knit presentation. I am just using some images to give some flavor of some data I am sharing because the language and region I am talking of would be unfamiliar to most of you, I think. So it must be helpful. So I just put some images. So like uh, Malayalam is a South Indian language uh, spoken by the inhabitants of Kerala, uh, a very small South Indian state. Like the population speaking Malayalam language is about uh, 35 million. So like uh, even though part of India, we don't have any acquaintance with Urdu, like from our local atmosphere, unless we go to Delhi or Bombay or Hyderabad and get trained in Urdu or like have such an exposure. We are not speaking uh, from our own state, like Hindi, Urdu, et cetera, are as foreign to us as English or German is. So that is the situation. So Malayalam is a totally different language. And speaking about Malayalam, you should, also have an idea of what Tamil is. Where's the Southern and like, this is Kerala and this is Tamil Nadu. These are linguistic states. Tamil and Malayalam are closely uh, related. Like actually Malayalam is derived from Tamil. Like some kind of North Indian influence came and some kind of a mixture was happening and Malayalam was deriving. But speaking about Malayalam translations of the Quran, on the very outset, I have to specify something about the script. Like Malayalam had different scripts in history at different points of time. Or like, uh, rather than speaking about time, I would say that Christians of Kerala, especially Syrian Christians, Syrian Christians were there like who migrated to Kerala uh, in uh, the ancient period. And they were using a Syrian script, a kind of adaptation of Syria to write Malayalam. And the Muslims were using Arabic script to write Malayalam, and it was called Arabic Malayalam. And the Hindus in, in Kerala, they, they used a different kind of script to use Malayalam, to write Malayalam. So Tamil was, the case was similar there. There was Arabic Tamil, like just like Urdu, like they, they were writing uh, Hindi dialect using Arabic script or Persian script. In the similar way, here Muslims were using Arabic script to write Malayalam. So, in the medieval period, it was the case, but in the modern era, what happened was the, the, the so-called Hindu Malayalam script was standardized and it was somewhat like it became the norm or it became the standard script of Malayalam and the Arabic script of Malayalam was a kind of marginalized or it was like, you know, uh, like dismissed or it was uh, like, it was no, no more in use. So uh, speaking about the Malayalam translations of Quran, first of all, I would say, uh, this is Arabic Malayalam. And this is the Gospel of Luke. And it was published by the Christian missionaries in Kerala to distribute among Muslims. So the Muslim, for the Muslims of Kerala to read, they need the script. Like uh, they were not able to read in the so-called Hindu script or Hindu Malayalam script. So uh, this one you can read easily, I think, Inji Luke, or like it is of Inji of Luke. Uh, this is the Hindu script of Malayalam. It is no more Hindu script. It is the standard script of Malayalam right now. And uh, in Arabic Malayalam in 19th century, there was an attempt to translate Tafsir Jalale into Arabic Malayalam script. And, uh, there was a Muslim kingdom in Kerala and it was called Arakkal kingdom. Like, uh, you know of Mughals, you know of like Delhi Sultanate or Bengal Nawabs. Actually in Kerala also like some for 300, 400 years, even though their principality was very small, there was a Muslim kingdom. And uh, one of their in-laws, his name was Mayanguti. He prepared a commentary of Quran in Arabic Malayalam uh, in towards mid uh, or around the mid of 19th century. And uh, it was somewhat uh, like he based uh, 
on Tafsir Jalalain for his uh, for preparing his work. And but the interesting thing is that even though it was uh, a translation of Tafsir Jalalain, and even though it was in Arabic, there was huge opposition from the traditional ulama. And it is said, and I don't know for sure, like it is like a fourth tale. The other finally he had to uh, uh, dump this uh, manuscript under the sea for as a jurisprudential solution like you cannot misbehave it you cannot disrespect it if because uh, there are quran verses on it in arabic so if you put it somewhere it would be disrespected so uh, the solution was that it was uh, uh, put in the sea in the arabian sea so that is what is said regarding it uh, then uh, Hermann Gunder, like he went all the way from Germany to Kerala for missionary work. He was part of the Basel mission and he was in Kerala for many decades. And like this was the house he, he lived in, in Northern Kerala. And he was very crucial in standardizing the Malayalam script. Like, uh, like the missionaries, uh, they used the Hindu script and they uh, started schools and they trained students in this script and they published pamphlets, they published books, they translated Bible into this and they started newspapers, even though Malayalis themselves were doing all sort of these things. So the missionary was, for, role was very crucial in, in, uh, the, uh, in making the Hindu script of Malayalam the standard script. So like the Muslim scholarly position was then was that the Hindu Malayalam script is it is something related to kafirs and Muslims should not be trained in it. Muslims should keep away from it. Muslims should stick to the Arabic Malayalam script. This Pannani uh, is a coastal town in Malabar. Waliya Palli literally means great mosque or something like that. Waliya is big and Palli is mosque. So uh, this is the traditional, like temples are also constructed this way because same architects came and Masjids and temples were, were built in a somewhat similar way. This is a medieval construction. Uh, this is in Malabar and like it was the, the uh, authority to issue fatwas for Muslims, that mosque and the, the madrasa inside it. So uh, it was uh, uh, like uh, stated that it is haram for Muslims to, to go to schools and get trained in the Hindu Malayalam script because the concept of Tashbih, the notion of Tashbih, like you are imitating non-believers. So the same was said for English as well, like English is a Christian language and this Malayalam script is a Hindu uh, uh, tradition and you cannot go for that. So it was the idea. So the Arabic Malayalam translation uh, faced such an opposition and then uh, regarding Malayalam, uh, that script itself was declared haram and there was no question of translating Quran into that script. But uh, slowly but surely what happened was that the schools got widespread governments uh, established more and more schools, Muslim students were uh, finally, they, they were reaching schools and everyone was trained in this Malayalam script and Arabic Malayalam uh, faced it, its death somewhat uh, in a way. So uh, everyone was reading and writing Malayalam. Uh, this is St. Francis Church, Kochi. This was uh, established by the Portuguese, like uh, they were the first uh, colonial invaders to uh, Kerala and uh, the Dutch and the British followed and Cochin was a, 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 a colonial hub or something like that and uh, there were large printing presses and missionaries were settling there and they were doing all kinds of activities and a scholar uh, of Malabar. His name is Sayyid Sanaullah Makti. He uh, migrated from Ponnani to Kochi to have an exposure of what is happening around. So he was like, he was saying that, you see the Muslim ulama of, of this land, you are insulating yourself from your surroundings. Like you are not uh, understanding what is happening around you. Like a new script is standardized here, standardized here you know, and the missionaries are distributing all kinds of tracts and pamphlets in, in that script. 
to this, the Hindus and to the Christians here. And in those tracts and pamphlets, they are distorting Quran. They are distorting life, the life of the Prophet. They are misrepresenting representing Islam. And you are not able to read that script. You are not trying to understand what is happening around you. So you should get trained in the script and you should attempt a translation of the Quran. In your madrasas, you are just trying to teach your children how to read the Quran and you are not trying to give the, the message to them. So this is his quote from one of his books. He ordered around 50 books and that was in the so-called Hindu script. And he was the first ever uh, Muslim scholar in Kerala to write in the so-called Hindu script about Islam. And he was responding to missionaries and he was heavily influenced by Ahmadullah Kairanavi and uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Like he, he uh, had uh, some kind of a North Indian uh, family background and he, he could read Urdu and he was exposed to do the all this kind of literary activism uh, that was becoming very uh, 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 like uh, uh, towards the end of 19th century in North India and he was inspired by that and he was trying to do something similar in Kerala in Malabar. So he was saying this children are taught only to read the Quran for years and years the training is the citation. No one is educated in the meaning of the holy text. How sad is this? The scholars keep themselves away from translating the Quran as they are truthfully aware that they are not competent enough in Malayalam script for attempting a translation. After all these years, we still don't have a single scholar fluent in Malayalam for translating the scripture for the people of this land. And by the people of this land, he, not only Muslims, he, he like, he imagines, like he, he argued very strongly that you should give Quran to Christians and you should give Quran to Hindus and Dawa is your fundamental duty and you cannot get away from this. So this was his argument and he was critiqued heavily. But uh, it is said that in, in his autobiography, he is, he is saying that he attempted a Quran translation and he uh, uh, did that, but he lost the manuscript somehow. So anyhow, it was not published. And he died in 1912. Uh, then, uh, like following his footsteps, perhaps like more and more reformers are, or like uh, those who were arguing for change were coming. And Pakkam Abdul Kader Maulavi was uh, preeminent among them. He uh, lived between uh, 1870s and 1930s. In 1932, he died. Uh, Akam Olavi uh, is very famous in the history of Kerala because he started a newspaper called Swadesh Abhimani. This is that. Swadesh Abhimani, like somewhat like a patriot or something like that, that, that could be roughly translated as this. And this was not a religious journal. It was a purely uh, newspaper. Like uh, it was meant for news and articles. And uh, historians of Kerala considered, uh, consider it as something very crucial in forming the colonial public sphere in Kerala. Like he was a Muslim scholar. He started this uh, newspaper in the, in the so-called Hindu Malayalam script. And it had direct link with Reuters. And he, its editor was a well-known journalist, a, a non-Muslim journalist called Ramakrishna Pilla. So he was very visible. Uh, he was an ardent reader of Almanar Mandali from Cairo. And he was uh, like, you know, <laughs> a fan of uh, Rashid Rila, if, if you could say. There is a letter published in Almanar by Vakka Molavi uh, uh, that he, he is like uh, showering all kind of praises to Rashid Rila that you enlightened me, you showed me the path, like uh, I now know the truth. I was uh, uh, in, uh, immersed in all kind of superstitions and now I know what real Islam is and like, you you showed me the way and uh, please send me Almana regularly and all these things he was saying. So uh, he started a journal called Muslim in uh, this uh, Malayalam script, standard Malayalam script, not in Arabic Malayalam, to educate and enlighten Kerala Muslims in the, uh, what, like he was really translating articles from Almana and he was sharing its ideas and many things he was doing. So this was the Muslim journal. He published journals in Arabic Malayalam as well. Like uh, uh, his Arabic Malayalam journal was called Al Islam. Like his logic was that I want to educate the uh, uh, common folk among Muslims, and they don't 
uh, uh, know how to read the standardized Malayalam script. So to address them, I am doing this, and especially for women, they they must read my article. So I am doing this, and in this al Islam, he translated. Uh, he started a column to translate Quran into Arabic Malayalam, and uh, it is still available. And he completed Surah Al Fatiha in some uh, five issues or something like that, and. It also uh, created huge controversy because it was translated as that, like uh, you alone we worship and to you alone we seek help. That alone uh, was uh, igniting a big controversy because the traditional Shafi, Ashari, Sufi, Ulama was claiming that, that seeking help is not something which is done that is not, uh, you can seek help from many others, like that holy man or something like that. So you are uh, very consciously trying to uh, confuse people about this and your uh, Quran translation is meant for something else. So that was the argument. And Vakam uh, Olavi was like, uh, he, uh, when he died, uh, there is a note in Rashid Riva Salmanar. Uh, it was sent by that letter, was sent by his, uh, one of his colleagues. And in his, it is mentioned that he was a Salafi in Malabar, like uh, uh, kind of Salafian. It is, it is uh, said uh, in his note by a friend. And um, he wrote a book to defend Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab in Malayalam. Uh, and uh, he, he uh, started the book by saying that. Uh, I started preaching Quran and Hadith in my land. I, I, I read Rashid Rila Salmanar and I understood these ideas. And people started calling me Wahhabi. Like, uh, like uh, I was simply translating Quran and Hadith. So what is this Wahhabi? I, I started to inquire. And uh, perhaps from Rashid Rila, his writings, especially towards the end of his life, he was championing Saudi Arabia and King Abdul Aziz. And uh, all those stuff came into Malayalam through Wakka Mulavi. And he was... Uh, Asking Kerala Muslims, uh, uh, like, uh, you should study Quran, you should study Sunnah instead of blindly following the clergy. So for that purpose, you should have a Quran translation. So he started a, a Malayalam, uh, a, a journal in a standard Malayalam script, and its name was Dibiga. Dibiga literally means, uh, literally could be translated into Arabic as Almanar. Like, uh, that... Uh, it is uh, something, uh, a word for that. So uh, in 1930s, he published that uh, monthly, and that monthly was uh, addressing Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Like it was preaching to both. And it had uh, uh, like a Quran uh, translation uh, column and like, like a series, he was doing the Quran translation, but uh, in the midway he died and it was not completed. So uh, that much. So in 1932, uh, uh, Wakamolevi died. Uh, in the meanwhile, like uh, a following was growing for Wakamolevi, uh, uh, like a Salafi group was uh, uh, like, especially an intellectual elite, not not very common people, uh, and they formed an organization in Kerala, and it was called Kerala Muslim Aikya Sangam. Kerala Muslim Aikya Sangam could be roughly translated as like. Kerala Organization for Muslim Unity or something like that. So, and they conducted annual conferences and in 1926 at Talashiri, they conducted the annual conference and Muhammad Marmaduk Piktal was the chief guest and he delivered a speech, like it was the presidential address. Like he was asking Muslims of Kerala, like you had a golden age, you contributed to science and what is your situation now? You should go to schools, you should learn science, you should learn English. These, these people, uh, the Salafi, Wahhabi terms usually make a picture like uh, very different from it. Like, uh, But these people were, uh, they were promoting modern education, they were promoting English education, they, they were promoting uh, science and you know, uh, uh, perhaps because of a heavy influence of the Egyptian Salafi trends. So, uh, but still they were supporting Saudi Arabia and King Abdul Aziz and Ibn Abdul Waqqa. And uh, the traditional Sufi, Ashari, Shafi, Ulama, they opposed not only theological positions expounded by the Kerala Muslim Aikya Sangam, but also uh, their support for modern education, Hindu script, Christian English. So uh, it was, uh, uh, heavily criticized by the Sufi section of the uh, uh, traditional ulama in Malabar saying that it is amounting to tandem on to Tashbih, which is 
uh, actually prohibited in Islam. So that was the debate that Pictar was coming. I think his Quran translation is not published at this time. It is uh, like, it is 1930, I think. But he was in Hyderabad uh, at that time. And I think he came there from Hyderabad and they are inviting him uh, to the, uh, this time. Uh, then in a book form, the first Malayalam translation of, of Quran came out in, in 1935. And it, uh, this Salafi intellectual elite actually published this, and uh, this, is, this, this is the first stage of the Quran, and uh, this is the second Jews, like uh, they published the first Jews and second Jews in two volumes, and uh, they formed a company to publish this, Muslim Literature Society. So, see, it was also heavily criticized, like opposition was were at various levels. On, on the one hand, it was said that Quran should not be translated or Quran, it is impossible to translate Quran. On, on one side, it was that. And then, uh, like uh, in Kerala, particularly, there was an argument that uh, a book in which Quran verses are written should not be handed over to non-Muslims. So when you print a book like this, it would be available in market and it would go to the man. Uh, the this uh, the Salafi intellectual elite they responded by by saying that uh, when Prophet Muhammad sent letters to non-Muslim kings, Bismillah Rahman Rahim was written over it, and it was not an issue. So that was the debate. And uh, adding to that, this opposition to the Hindu script was uh, always in the air. So this was that uh, translation and. Uh, uh, these are the pages. Uh, I am just showing you the layout, and it had a brief commentary. And it is 1935, and he was the driving force uh, behind it. I am just showing him like a traditional Mapla Muslim scholar, like he uh, was known as K. Molavi, and he was the closest disciple of Akka Molavi. So he was like a father figure for the for the Salafi, like. They called themselves as Islahis or like Islahi movement. They introduced themselves as this. So uh, he was like the, the scholarly uh, head of the movement. And uh, like these were the translators who attempted this uh, uh, translation and uh, to make the Malayalam good. Like the, those were traditional Muslim scholars and they didn't get school education. So they appointed two editors to, uh, who, who, uh, who were really trained in schools and uh, to make the, uh, that Malayalam very good. And this person, Ken Sidi, uh, is very famous in Kerala his history because he was a member of the Legislative Assembly and he was uh, the speaker of, of Kerala Legislative Assembly and he was very active in the Salafi, Bahabi, Islahi wave in Kerala. So, uh, then uh, this figure, the first one, Wakka Muhammad Maidin, he was a nephew of uh, Wakka Maulavi, and he was doing many translations uh, during this period. And this is Al Usul Salata of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. It was translated into Malayalam in 1948, and like 2,500 copies it is written. Uh, uh, it was published at that time. and. This is Sayyid Sulaiman and Nadavi's uh, book on Hadith, like uh, arguing that Hadith is also a proof in Islam and not only Quran should uh, lead you, that was the argument. So like a translation uh, movement, something like that was evolving and uh, Wakam Maulavi's disciples were actively translating the global into the local. Like even Sayyid Sulaiman Nadavi's book, uh, it was, it's originally is in Urdu. It is published in North India, but he translated it from Arabic because Sayyid Rashid Rila translated it into Arabic and published it in Almanar. So he was reading Almanar and he was translating it into Malayalam. So uh, uh, this was uh, the situation. And uh, uh, during this time, uh, like uh, some Jews of Quran were, were uh, published by the same authors. Uh, and this Wakam Muhammad Maidin uh, completed, uh, attempted a complete translation of the Quran, and he actually did it in 1950s, but it was unpublished. And uh, recently, uh, the Kerala University published it, like uh, they, they found the manuscript. It was so the first completed translation of Quran was done by this Wakam Muhammad Maidin, like he, he was a nephew of Wakam Olavi. Uh, but it was unpublished at that time, and it didn't have any impact on the Muslim community. 
and uh, salafi arabic malayalam translation of the quran was done uh, in the 1950s by uh, umar maulavi like he was you know these people were going to saudi arabia and meeting ibn baz and ibn baz he's actually mentioning his name in some of his tracts umar ahmad malaybari he is he is mentioning to him so uh, that kind of a, a global connection was happening and the, this guy maulavi he met Uh, king abdul aziz in person and he gave a memorandum and he was saying that you know like now among kerala muslims there are salafis like some uh, 30 years ago we we started salafi dawa uh, you should be aware of that like uh, uh, like companies are being established here and you should consider your salafi brother and some kerala for jobs here instead of uh, okay uh, uh considering uh, americans or some something like that so uh, <laughs> that memorandum is still preserved so uh, i am speaking about the situatedness of this this quran translations uh, in malayalam in the global uh, landscape of salafism uh, or something like that so uh, in 1960s full full uh, commentaries of quran were published and three full commentaries were published and all were more or less influenced by salafi ideals i would say and uh, this is cn ahmed molavi uh, muhammad amani molavi and koya uh, kutti uh, molavi and uh, what's happening okay Uh, this is quite a typical his translation like he he could read english well he translated ibn khaldun's muqaddima he was good at music he, he was good in philosophy so that translation was of that kind and like it didn't generate much discussion in the community uh, but the next translation it, it ignited many controversies like it was cn ahmed molavi and uh, this translation was published with government funding central government funding and it was distributed to government agencies like he was uh, in a way part of the salafi movement in kerala but he was very progressive in his outlook and he did a translation of sahih al bukhari and many hadiths were not in the translation it was in the actual text like he felt them like you know those hadiths are fabricated and it might create uh, give a wrong impression of islam to non muslims so we should just remove it from sahih al bukhari so uh, that was ian ahmed molavi and his quran translation some of his propositions ignited huge controversies he was saying that jinns are actually uh, a kind of uh, uh, aboriginal tribe and it is not something some uh, 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 another uh, uh, creation of allah and the adam ibli story is just a metaphor it is not something that literally happened he was arguing and uh, such kind of things and he was arguing and then uh, as a response to it the the official safi response came i i say official because by that time an organization a, a mass movement a mass salafi movement was formed in kerala and it is called kerala nadwatul mujahideen and that mujahideen like jihad uh, has nothing to do with what what we uh, hear from the jihadi movements their yeah. movements like uh, in a way uh, uh, they were uh, pacifists and and uh, they were uh, uh, working in the in the in the legal framework of kerala and they were very much integrated to the secular ethos of that state and they were active in the secular political parties there so uh, this movement published an official quran tafsir uh, and that quran tr- translation that is uh, i am showing this and this is muhammad amani maulavi's translation and it is very famous and almost in every muslim household in kerala now there is this translation and this is the official salafi publication and it responds to cn ahmed maulavi's progressive reformist suggestions regarding this quran verses in very uh, in a very detailed manner like uh, i am showing the first pages and this is the foreword by uh tay molavi and uh, he is saying that i can say for sure that this translation and commentary follow the footsteps of the salaf all good is in following the salaf and all evil emanates from the bidas constructed by the khalaf so uh, it is like uh, like like 
Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, it it dismissed C N Ahmed Molvi's translation that as deviating from the position of Salaf. I'll just show like uh, some of the pages, and you see a chart here. Uh, I conclude with that. Like uh, C N in uh, C N Ahmed Molvi in his translation said that like Moses uh, leading uh, the children of Israel, he uh, uh, reached in front of Red Sea, and he. Uh, uh, using his st stick, he struck the sea uh, as per the instruction of God, and the part turned into house. Like he was saying that it is, it was not the case. Like there were some shallow regions in the sea, and people actually, you know, just using the stick, he found that way and he escaped. And Pharaoh was not aware of this, and he like so, uh, like he he felt that miracles are not presentable to the modern community. So that was the issue. So the official in the official Salafi response, like Laraba, that that Laraba is the word in the Quran. So, so they are giving all the meanings given in dictionaries and tafsirs, and they are arguing that this is totally like. Uh, unacceptable, this kind of an interpretation. So this is Amani Mollif, this tafsir, and uh, the remaining, I don't know, I like <laughs> somewhere, okay? Okay, I conclude.